We are delighted to be joined tonight by a quartet of fabulous Vermont women authors who each write wonderfully fantastical, mysterious, magical, and haunting novels. With strong female characters and often with a familiar Vermont or New England adjacent setting, these four authors have each penned incredible stories that we're so excited to talk about tonight. Please welcome Catherine Arden, Anne Davila Cardinal, Margot Harrison, and Sarah Stewart Taylor. New York Times bestselling author who began her writing writing her breakthrough Russian set Winter Night trilogy while living in the jungle of Hawaii. <laughs> Though writing was never her expected path, she drew inspiration from her years living in Moscow and took to putting her thoughts on paper to stave off boredom while picking coffee on the farm. <laughs> Lucky for all of us, her trilogy took off and she's now the author of a number of books for adults and children, her most recent being Warm Hands of Ghosts. She lives in Waterbury with her husband and dog among their gardens. Anne Davila Cardinal is a self-proclaimed tattooed punk who comes from a long line of Puerto Rican writers. She received her MFA from the Vermont College of Fine Arts and published her first young adult horror novel called Five Midnights in 2019. The book won an International Latino Book Award for Best Young Adult Fantasy and Adventure. She went on to write a handful of other award-winning YA books, and in 2022, published her first adult novel, The Storyteller's Death. We Need No Wings is her second novel for adults. She lives in a spooky old Vermont house with her husband. <laughs> Margot Harrison is a Vermont Book Award finalist author. She grew up in the wilds of New York and spent her childhood staying up late to read scary books. That love of the spooky carried into adulthood, where she began writing young adult thrillers in 2016. The Midnight Club is her first adult novel. When she's not writing, she enjoys reviewing vintage YA books, scary movies, and making skits about her weird childhood on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> she lives in the Burlington area. Sarah Stewart Taylor is a former teacher and journalist turned award-winning author. Her multiple series take us to the hills of Ireland, to Long Island, and all around the gravestones of New England. Agony Hill is the start of a new series that takes place in Vermont in the 1960s. Having been educated in Middlebury College and in Trinity College in Dublin, she's influenced by the setting she knows and loves and has found her sweet spot for these atmospheric mysteries. She lives with her family on a farm here in Vermont where they raise sheep and grow blueberries. And now, let me turn it over to these fabulous women here to discuss their latest novels and the Vermont writing life, Catherine, Anne, Margo, and Sarah. <laughs> Wanna, well, we're going to read a little bit. Um, right, Claire? Yeah. yeah. Um, should I start, guys, and we'll go down this way? Uh, sure. Yeah, okay. tell us okay. a little bit about the book. Sure. This is We Need No Wings. Um, it's actually about a UVM professor. Um, and I'm not going to give away much because I'm going to read the beginning of it. Um, but it's uh, magical realism. And it sort of ties together uh, some of my personal history, I've been told my whole life that my Puerto Rican family was descended from the family of St. Teresa of Avila, who was known to levitate. Um, I was like, you know, she was a nun. It's not directly descended. <laughs> so, but, you know, I got reprimanded when I was saying that at events because my, I guess the guy who found the connection in my family, the cousin, is a very famous scholar. So I'm like, okay, fine. I would like to see the DNA. By the way. <laughs> um, I should actually ask the priest because they dug her up last month. Wow. Wow. I was not very happy about it. Yeah, they keep opening her up and say that she's immutable. <laughs> she's still intact and smells like roses. I saw her finger. It's not, it's not intact. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to read the first page and a half. The first time Tere Sanchez levitated, she was in the garden. She aimed the hose in an arc over the lush peony bushes, the stream of water, fa falling water glinting like diamonds in the sunlight. The blooms were releasing their clean, sweet scent in clouds, and she closed her eyes and inhaled deeply, her mind and body slowing. Her husband had planted them for her, since she found the scent of the many-petaled flowers intoxicating. She remembered the day she'd come home early from the university to find his muddy but fine jean-covered ass sticking out from between three young bushes. He was so excited for her to see the new additions to his immaculately manicured garden. The man wasn't effusive, 
rarely expressing his emotions or complimenting her, but he demonstrated his affections in more tangible ways, in ways that lasted. They had made love right there on the grass next to the newly padded down earth that still held imprints of his big knuckled hands. Now, 10 years later, the peonies were wild and unrestrained, their bloom-laden branches breaching the careful mulch boundaries he laid for them. And in this state, the bushes were more like her. As she inhaled, a feeling of lightness spread through her body, not the dizziness that sometimes plagued her, no, more like the restraints of her day-to-day -day life released their hold. And Tere felt as if she had slipped outside her body, outside time, place, she let out an audible sigh in that moment of near ecstasy, then slowly opened her eyes to see the pink flowers getting farther away, the stream of water lengthening like a bartender lifting the bottle as he poured. She looked down and saw her green stained sneakers hovering a foot above the grass. What the actual fuck? <laughs> the familiar electric heat of panic flooded her body in a wave and suddenly she no longer felt weightless, but rather unbalanced, out of control. She pinwheeled her arms and kicked her legs, but all this did was upend her in the air and until she was horizontal to the ground, frantically swimming with her limbs and getting nowhere. She held tight to the bright green hose, the only thing tethering her to the earth. Her stomach lurched and she wondered if she was gonna vomit. Meanwhile, all she could do was impotently flail about like a fish on a dock. Then, ever so slowly, she lowered to the ground until she lay grabbing at the grass with her fists breathing heavily, her pulse racing. She tried to take mindful breaths in through her nose and out through her mouth, then flipped over onto her back, putting her hands to her chest. She let go of the hose and now it whipped around like a cobra, occasionally spraying cold water into her side and across her stomach, soaking her well-worn Ramones t-shirt. Tere lay there looking at the cloudless blue Vermont sky, occasionally glittering with drops of hose water, wondering what the hell had just happened or if anything had happened. Had she finally lost her mind? Mm. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so uh, Agony Hill is the first in a new mystery series set in Vermont in the 1960s. And it opens in the hot summer of 1965 um, when Franklin Warren, a uh, Boston homicide detective who um, has had a tragedy in Boston, um, moves to a small town in Vermont to take a job with the Vermont State Police. And he has barely unpacked when he's called up to a suspicious fire on a road called Agony Hill. And um, he immediately has a lot of questions about the farmer who has died in the fire, about his family. Um, and as he gets settled into his new hometown, he has a lot of questions about his next door neighbor as well. Um, Alice Bellows is a uh, woman of a certain age who has moved back to her hometown and, as Warren discovers, uh, has a bit of a history with the uh, intelligence world. And um, Alice is now sort of bored in this small town and um, she likes the idea of living next door to an investigator. And maybe, just maybe, he likes the idea of living next to someone who knows everything that happens in the town. So I'm just going to read you a short section um, from the prologue of the book, which features neither Warren nor Alice. <laughs> um, it, it, it features a character named Sylvie Weber, who will, who will become very important to the story. So Sylvie and her four young boys have, uh, the family has just finished haymaking, and it's a hot day. They've gone down to the swimming hole to cool off. By the time she and the smaller boys had made their way through the thick trees and down the bank, Scott was standing on the diving rock, ready to jump. Green, greeny water ripples, soft as milk top cream. Sylvie's a poet, I should say. So she has these thoughts. Yahoo! His yelp broke the silence, and then the other boys were in, leaping, splashing, filling the swimming hole. It was almost supernaturally lovely. The little green pool formed where the brook dropped beneath the road. The first time she had seen it, Hugh leading her down by the hand for skinny dipping at dusk after their wedding, she decided it was an enchanted fairy glade. 
The birches all around the brook were covered with green moss. Beyond the basin were little waterfalls and hidden lands among tree roots. Higher up the banks, ferns waved. Fern fronds filling. She sat on the huge rock, a seat worn into the surface by decades of sitters. And then she stripped Daniel naked and let him sit in the shallow edges. He dug his fingers into the wet sandy soil, pulled up roots, shouted at the small fish that darted in and out of the little pools. The other boys splashed and jumped and she trailed her feet in the water, a hand on her belly. Curled minnow hiding, a beginning in my middle. The baby was moving now. She had felt the little bubbling feeling a few times. It would be born just before Christmas, Dr. Falconer had told her when she went to see him. Stop splashing me, Andy yelled. He didn't like to be splashed before he'd gotten wet. Sylvie met Scott's eyes and shook her head. Reluctantly, he turned to Lewis, who loved to be tackled and splashed and thrown into the water. She smiled, feeling satisfied and happy. For this moment, she was giving them exactly what they wanted and needed. For this moment, they were all where they wanted to be. They must have been there for an hour when she looked up and saw the man. He was standing up on the bank on the other side of the brook, staring down at them, a dark hat pulled down low over his face so that she knew he was only, she knew he was male only from his body. He had a straggly dark beard and he was smoking a cigarette. That was what made the boys look up, the smell of smoke on the wind. Despite the fact that she couldn't see his face, she knew she had never seen him before. He was completely unknown to her and he had come out of the dark acreage of the forest. Scott froze where he was standing in the cold water and looked at her. Something in the downward cast of his gaze made her drop her eyes to the man's hand. He had a knife, a dark small thing he held out in front of him. She thought about saying something, about screaming, but she was as incapable of it as, if, as she was of flying. He spoke for her. Come on up here, he told her. He shifted the knife to the other hand, then back to where it had been. The blade was pointing down toward the boys in the swimming hole. They were almost a mile from the house. Hugh wouldn't hear her over the rushing water. If she, to if she told the boys to run, they'd have to pass the man with the knife. Scott started to speak, but she shook her head and said, stay with them, keep them safe. And then to the man, I'm coming up. Her voice carried out and up and over the glade. Green, innocent moss, pillowy planks of rock. She stood up and started walking. Stop there. <laughs> story of four Gen Xers who have a, who reunite in the, their old college town to remember their friend who died in college before graduation. And one of the friends, the, the one who's hosting this reunion, convinces the others to take a memory drug. This is the speculative part of the novel. It doesn't exist. Um, so that they can remember their dead friend in vivid detail and maybe find out <clears throat> whether she died the way that they thought or in some more sinister way. So it begins with the invitation to this unusual private reunion which takes place in a Vermont town that was based on Johnson, if you're familiar with that at all. <clears throat> you are hereby formally invited to a reunion of the Midnight Brunch Club. October 27th through 31st, 2014, 12 Railroad Street in Dunstan, Vermont. Come to celebrate the life of Jennifer, Janet, Cheryl, and Stark, 1967 to 89, and revisit our shared past through the elixir of the pines. There are still secrets to be discovered. The past is not even past, Faulkner. We are boats against the current, Fitzgerald. Leave all doubts and inhibitions at home. RSVP to Orly Lydgate. The first time Sonia ever received an invitation from Orly Lydgate was in the Dovecat room freshman year on the first warm spring day in Vermont. 
Forsythia bursting forth on the quad. Sonia was bent over a Mac Classic when Orly swept in, wearing a leather jacket and drop waist mini dress, and noisily slid out, slid out a chair. Oh my god, I'm dealing with a roommate nightmare. Marina got this brilliant idea to backpack in Europe, so now Paul and I are short a person for the townhouse. Paul Breton? Sonia couldn't hide her surprise. He was the newly elected editor of their lit magazine, quiet, earnest, and formidably intellectual. Orly was rich and from LA and had a husky laugh that made boys' eyes glaze over. They seemed like a complete mismatch. Yeah, Orly grinned. No, we're not dating. I like his espresso machine and he likes my cooking. Hey, wait, do you have housing for next year? I was just going to do the lottery. This was only their second or third conversation. And Sonia, the daughter of an itinerant hippie who could only afford the college because of her mom's job in the admin office, could barely understand why Orly would talk to her to begin with. When Orly spoke again, Sonia almost thought she was hearing wrong. Would she like to share the townhouse with them instead? It cost more than the dorm, but Sonia barely hesitated in saying yes. She was tired of studying alone in the library and coming back to a silent room. She was tired of feeling like she didn't belong. Never mind that Orly later admitted the invitation had been spur of the moment, based more on what Sonia wasn't than what she was. You seemed quiet. I figured it would balance out my loud. In that instant, whether Sonia realized it or not, she became part of a circle she would never quite be able to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, the Midnight Club. Not the Midnight Brunch Club, because that suggests a food book. <laughs> that is the name of their club. <laughs> um, so The Warheads of Ghosts is my novel. It is not set in Vermont. It's set in um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and also in Belgium um, during the last year of the First World War. And it, um, it follows two main characters, a Canadian combat nurse who's been invalided home after an injury, um, and her brother who's gone missing on the Western Front in the last months of the war. Um, and she, having lost her, uh, spoilers, um, she goes back, the main character, this nurse, goes back um, to the front to try to find her brother um, because she's not convinced he's dead. So, since this is not necessarily a book tour event, um, I wanted to do something different with my reading. Um, this book began as a totally different idea, which happens actually a lot of times. I had an idea for a ghost story set in Brussels after, first, after the First World War, um, but the idea was too small. It was too thin for a full novel. So I put it down and ended up writing this book. But I recently resurrected the first idea as a short story. And um, I want to read a part of it because I don't get a chance to read my short fiction almost ever. So. Um, <laughs> it's called Rosebud, the short story. It was January when we came to Brussels, my sister and my aunt and I, although the war had ended in November. My father had gone ahead of us and he said he would have a place ready and indeed he had taken a house. But he had no notion of housekeeping or organization and so we were none of us surprised to find the house while surprisingly large and surprisingly grand to be nearly bare of furniture, except for a few pieces half buried in grime, their dust sheets long since hauled away for bandages. Susan, of course, was enchanted by the vast echoing spaces and the dust did not make her sneeze. She waltzed around the ballroom, startling three bats out of their roost, leaving footprints in the slippery dust, curls round as candlesticks coming loose and looping down her back. Isn't it beautiful, she said. Honestly, I couldn't see it. I had been sneezing from the moment I set foot in the house. My eyes were streaming, and it was dark to begin with. The January dust came quickly, and in those lean days of rationed oil, the street lights did not come on. When I put a hand to the light switch, it rattled and clicked and spat and flickered, showing the ballroom in uncertain pieces, molding and cornices, peeling gilt, and the shredded remains of rose trellis wallpaper, a floor of glorious parquet, splintered and softened and scraped by careless booted feet, 
with electric, li electric lines and phone lines stapled higgledy-piggledy to the moldy wall. In my wavering vision, it looked cold and sinister. Wretched man, that father of yours, said Aunt Irene, who had sneezed twice, tidily, and then put her handkerchief away. I was still leaning on the door frame, not so much sneezing as attempting to expel the contents of my skull through my nose. <laughs> Tells us he's let an historic house. Well, historic it is. Historic enough to choke on. She patted me on the back while I wheezed. There, there, dear. It will pass soon enough. Sue, come back this instant. Susan was already darting back across the floor, dancing a wild waltz with her own shadow, and the unshaded, and the unshaded light, still crackling and flickering, turned her high-colored face garish, and made cobwebs of her swinging hair. She was smiling. I think it's lovely, she said. Did Father say why it was historic? No, said Irene. She sniffed. You know how he is. Too busy planning the fate of the world. Stop there. <laughs> You talked about sort of inspiration. I'm, and I love the sort of the backward or, or disangled way we get to these. What, for each of you, like what, other than the traditional line you say in book tour, you know, what, what was something that inspired the book that you don't often talk about? This particular book. Is that a this question? Um. I mean, every, I feel like, as writers, we kind of live in this sea of ideas and notions. Like, almost every day there's something, like a pic an image, or a picture, or a thought, or like a what if. Um, and a lot of writers write those things down. Like, they have like a list going of just thoughts. Um, and I think some ideas are big and can be novels. Some ideas are small and can be short stories. Um, and some ideas combine to make a novel. Like, you have four different notions that you think, oh, those could work well together as one book. Um, and I almost feel like the trick of writing is not so much inspiration per se, it's finding how to take your inspiration and make it into something readable, which is definitely the trick. Um, people will tell you, like, as a writer, I have a great book idea, and you're like, that's amazing. <laughs> that's 2%, and then 98% is yeah. actually getting from idea to a text that other people can read. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marco? Um, yeah, <laughs> this, I mean, I think my, this book is proof of that, that the idea is not enough, because this took me literally 37 years to, um, from idea to actual published book, <laughs> and there were many drafts of it, um, drafts that were 500 pages and 700 pages, and many different things did ins inspire it, and I think I probably have talked about all of them already, <laughs> but um, there was an episode of Unsolved Mysteries about a girl who suddenly got amnesia and couldn't remember anything. There was a New Yorker story about an artist who painted his childhood village, his memories, obsessively. I think that was the biggest inspiration, memory obsession. Like, what if you could actually recapture your memories in cinematic detail? Would you become obsessed with them? Would you want to live in the past? Because I think I might. <laughs> so, so that was the greatest inspiration, um, but there are many over the years that helped me because um, I, I had to shape it, I had to turn it from something that I thought would be like a, a Thomas Pynchon novel into a kind of marketable semi-mystery book that people are calling Dark Academia. I, I never even thought of it as that, but apparently that's what it is. <laughs> that's because that's hot right now. Yeah. <laughs> I love the idea that a finished book contains the ghosts of other books. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, and they almost always do, I think. Like, yeah. the books they might have been, the books you wrote first, the drafts you did. Yeah. It's all these, like, different impressions of, like, the other book kind of lingering in the mm. finished text, which is really yeah. cool. Oh, definitely. Sarah, what about you? So, um, you know, I think this was a, a book that had been knocking around in my head for a long time. And, you know, I think... Um, it's, I've talked about some of the inspirations, but when I was working as a journalist um, in, I, I live in the Upper Valley, and when I was working as a journalist, there, um, a, a group was building a co-housing community in Heartland, which is actually the town where I live. 
And I was assigned to cover sort of the development of, of this co-housing community. And I went out and interviewed a lot of people who had been part of the sort of mid-60s, late-60s, early-70s um, commune movement in, in Vermont and New Hampshire. And interviewed, you know, there, there had been a couple of fairly well-known communes right around um, where I live. And so I, you know, I interviewed some of the people. and. It, there was just this, uh, it just, the way they described this period in Vermont history was just so fascinating. And in particular, um, I interviewed somebody who was kind of describing everyone who lived at his commune. And he, you know, most of the people were, you know, he, he would say, oh, and she was very good at, at baking bread and weaving, and he was really good at, like, you know, raising sheep and chickens and, um, and then he was talking about another guy, and he said, well, he wasn't really good at anything. <laughs> and he was a miserable son of a bitch. Everyone hated him. And I just sort of loved the idea of this, of this commune, where like, there was this one guy who everybody hated. So that was like a little, I do have a, t a, a sort of terrible back to the lander of this book. And so that was sort of like the kernel of that. Um, but I, you know, more generally, I think the book really just came out of, um, like I served on my, my town school board and so many of the issues we were dealing with, school consolidation and aging school buildings and you know, like when we would go back to figure out where did this start? How, where, you know, what was the first iteration of this problem? It, it, it was all sort of back in this period of the mid 60s when mm -hmm. Vermont was undergoing radical, radical change in so many ways and the coming of the interstates. And, um, so yeah. Interesting. Um, I mean, I talked a bit about St. Teresa, so that and family history, and but the other, another really big inspiration for doing character of a certain age um, is that I d wasn't seeing myself um, in in representations of of my generation. I mean, we're children of the '60s. We're not coastal grandmas. All of us, and if you choose to do that, that's fine. Mostly twenty-year-olds who want to look like coastal grandmas, not not actual <laughs> boomers. But you know, it it, it really it, it interests me the way we're per perceived. And I actually had a, um, and so I wanted to do a character who was more like me and my friends who talked like I did. And and it's interesting. I was telling these guys before at dinner. I my I'm working on a um, a punk rock Miss Marple. <laughs> series and so uh, but I it was submitted to a top five publisher and the editor had asked for my work and she's 31 years old this editor and she read it she goes you know I loved it I love the premise I love the character but I found the older characters voices to be inauthentic <laughs> and I said to my agent I was like wait a minute she's saying that she understands what my generation sounds like better than I do mm -hmm. and she and my agent was very angry and so I was like, these are the gatekeepers, because most of publishing is that age. Because those are the only ones who can afford to live in New York City, right? And so, you know, you have all of these 30-year-olds deciding what older women sound like, what older men sound like. And it's like, that's, so, so I want, it has become my quest to change the way we sound. And so I ended up, you know, my, my original publisher loves my weirdness and they get me. And so I'm, I'm doing it with them because they just understand. And they love the idea of having a, 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 a subversive 60-year-old character. <laughs> and so I'm having fun with it. And I, you know, I've been reading a lot of Miss Marple and she's so mannered. Um, but I don't know whether there's an Agatha Christie fans in here, but she, she's so mannered. But the woman does, she asks for forgiveness not permission and I those are the women who inspire me mm -hmm. um, and so even though that predates the sort of age of the characters since they're contemporary I'm really enjoying sort of uh, seeing the history of this so this has become my new quest is to sort of shake up how and I'm, I'm trying to convince younger writers to also shake that up when they have characters of a certain age in there I mean of a certain age I don't like that either but there isn't really an, exp an expression um, because old ladies, when I was young, don't look like we do now. Um, and so I think it needs to be updated. So it's become a, that was one of the inspirations for this book. So, yeah. Should we talk a little bit about our process? I know I always love to hear about like, 
how, like, what time of day do you all write? I'd love to know. Where do you write? And what's your what's what's your process like? Do you write quick first drafts? Do a lot of revision? Are your first drafts perfect? <laughs> so I'll hate you. I'll hate you. <laughs> um, am I? I am fast unless I'm slow for some reason. I think it's true. A lot of writers. Um, do y'all do y'all like word count goals every day? How do you draft? Cause I do like a two, I have like a word count goal every day when I'm drafting something. I do pages. Pages. I, feel I do like scenes. Scenes. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Scenes. So I have like a goal every day. I try to like do admin in the morning, which is like email, social media, more email, um, letters. Actually, a lot of kids write, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's lovely. Um, I try to write them back. Um, so that kind of stuff, and then the afternoons I try and write. So, um, just when I'm drafting, just like get it down. Um, and then when I'm editing, I can be work super long hours if I'm on deadline, especially. I think everyone's been in there where you have to like yeah. work really late nights or like days. only caffeine and sugar, like very unhealthy, but like <laughs> <laughs> like being in college. I have a pretty chaotic process. Until recently, I had a nearly full, a pretty demanding job, so I would fit writing around the edges of that. And I'm a night owl, so I can't get up early in the morning and write. And often, I would be doing it um, late at night in bed while eating like the healthy version of Pringles. <laughs> <laughs> there is a healthy version. Right. I think they're called like good chips or something like that. Good crisps. Good crisps. Yeah, I don't have the most ergonomics set up, but um, so yeah, I would just kind of fit it in, and I, I don't do word count or anything like that. I use index cards, and I try to finish certain scenes on certain days, but I don't always succeed. And I do go back and revise as I write. I kind of need to do that. Um, I, I don't, I can't write the whole draft entirely through, which a lot of people kind of insist on doing nowadays. But I will go back, polish, reshape things, and then continue. Interesting. All right, there's some good variety here. Um, I'm a morning writer. I love, you know, the, I'm best in the morning. I save email and business stuff for the afternoon because I, like, I don't want to waste those morning brain cells, I guess. <laughs> My brain's just getting old. Um, and I, I have, you know, like I have an office and I have a desk I like to write at, but my real favorite secret thing is that I love writing in bed <laughs> and I've always felt really ashamed of it and very guilty and just like I shouldn't do it and it seemed awful. And, um, I think it's because I always felt like, like this is my brother in here and I feel like dad would really not think that was okay, right? Like that, he would be so, he really has like a good like Yankee work ethic and he, that would not be okay. But I, I love it and I'm very productive in bed and I was recently on tour and I, there were like three women on a panel with me and every single one of them said that they write in bed and so now I feel newly liberated <laughs> to admit this to you. Do um, you have a computer? I have a laptop, yeah. Or you handwrite? So, no, lap, laptop. Laptop. Yeah, do, laptop? I laptop. Yeah. Pen. Pen. Okay. Oh my wow. goodness. Wow. I can't even read my own handwriting. <laughs> I often do draft it longhand because I find it really helps me to get get the scene on the paper and then I'll yeah. type it in to the laptop. Apparently Edith Wharton wrote all her books in bed. Yeah, I mean, wow. here, if Edith can do it, I can do it. <laughs> um, so, and I'm a, I write a very messy rough draft all the way through. I have to, to get the story down, and then a ton of revision. Um, so. I don't write in bed. I, <laughs> no, I need to have, um, I have a large screen. I use a laptop as well, a Mac, but I, I have a very large screen because I cite whatever, I want to see it. Um, and I really, when I'm writing on the road, it's it. I have to get used to it again. And I have a, a mouse and I have a mechanical keyboard because I like the sound. Mm -hmm. And if you said that to me when I was 15, I would be like, what are you talking about? You have computers now, but I like the, the feel of an old sort of typewriter. Um, but I have, and my, my office is, over, is filled with stuff on the walls. I have friends who need like pristine walls and, and no, I'm like chaos. 
I like chaos. It's neat, but there's stuff on all the walls. And during the pandemic, I started putting my books behind because I was doing book events that were all on Zoom. And so I sort of like that. And so I, I like writing in my home space. Um, my first drafts are torture. It, it is like pulling teeth and I, it's like the chair's electrified. Mm. Oh, I gotta get up. Oh, I gotta clean under the sink. <laughs> and one time I said, I was in the kitchen, my husband's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm cleaning the silver. He says, we don't have any silver. I said, we have these five things. And he's like, go back in the office. So, but once I finish the first draft, I tell you what, I really believe there is no better feeling. Um, seeing your book in, in, in print and holding it is nothing compared with saying, I wrote a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the revision process is, is the real art for me. I mean, I think the first draft is storytelling and then the revision is the art. And I love that process until I don't. Um, <laughs> but it really, I, I do like a home base. I do like, I have written, I write screenplays well on airplanes, I think because I'm sedated. I have to be sedated to fly, and so I'm like, oh, blah, blah. and then I actually read it later. I'm like, that's not bad. <laughs> of course, I haven't sold one, so I don't know. But you know, I'm not. I like to to do the home base thing, and I think a lot of it is the eyesight. I like to see it big, you know. Um, three of you, anyway, have a lot of. Um, a little magical surrealism, a little fantasy, a speculative twist. Does that give you some kind of freedom to your writing where you can kind of get creative? Does this give you more, um, more leeway? It does both. I mean, I think. Um, it gives you freedom and it also sort of, you know, you, you have magical systems in some books and you got to keep track of them and there's got to be cost for them and there's all sorts of things you have to keep in mind. but. I was raised raised on magical realism, you know, Marquez and Cortazar, and there was no YA when I was young. And so I read what was on the shelf, Harold Robbins. But mainly what I read was the magical realist novels because I liked the fact that, you know, I had a difficult childhood and, and with magic you have hope, right? Mm -hmm. And so I really liked that. So for me, it, it, it honestly, I don't want to write a book that doesn't have some element. I mean, you all have written a very, well, no, Marcos, all your books have magical elements. Most, most of them, yeah. I mean, I yeah. wouldn't say a fantasy element is like a way out of trouble in your plotting, like, because all books need internal logic, and so yeah. you can't like, like, ex machina some magic to get yourself out of something, because the reader would rebel. The reader would be like, what is this nonsense? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So you need like your, your emotional logic too, like you can't skimp on like having like understandable logical character arcs that make emotional sense to a reader. Um, magic no matter doesn't matter as long as, as the emotions are there. Um, so magic is great in a book. It's not like a get out of trouble free card for a writer. I wish it was, um, <laughs> but it is not unfortunately. Yeah, I always knew that I wanted to write something speculative. I mean, this memory drug concept, it's like something that in theory, I guess could exist, but definitely does not. Um, but I think when I, when I first started trying to shop my novel around, that adult fiction was just not receptive to that, so I kind of gave up on it. Um, and that changed with the success of Station Eleven, which is a literary oh, novel, it's a beautiful a book. focused novel, and it's also speculative, it's also, um, you know. So, um, so that kind of freed me up to combine those elements. But it's, it's interesting because I sort of do this dance across genres, like, I mean, the imprint that I'm with is not a science fiction imprint, and this is kind of a borderline science fiction book. So I had a lot of discussions with my editor, who I think is not a science fiction reader, and she was not familiar with the concepts of time paradoxes. You know, when you time travel, a lot of weird things happen, a lot of things that are not logically explicable because, you know, people can't time travel. So um, we had some very interesting conversations and went back and forth over and over. And what it came down to was that the focus had to be on the characters and the logic of the time travel and so on had to serve the character development. Should we talk about how editorial works, like what that means for professional writers? Is that interesting to people? I'm sorry, how what works? Editorial works. Oh, how ed mm -hmm. sure. Working with, working with an editor. Is that something yeah. that's like sure. interesting? 
Somebody else talk. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I have a developmental agent, and so, and that is not always true. So my agent works with me, and actually things have shifted. We were discussing this earlier. Um, they say editors no longer edit. Um, that's not really true. But um, my agent helps me develop things initially, and it helps make them more marketable. And her input is incredibly valued. She also went to Vermont College of Fine Arts. And she, she went to become a, a developmental agent. And so it's been a very interesting process. So she helps me develop it, and then working with the editor, um, I feel like so much of what happens with me is that the the, the, the story elements are there, but I haven't pulled them out enough. Mm -hmm. And what, what an editor does is like a midwifery sort of thing where it's, they're helping you, the things are already there, the threads are already there, but they're helping you bring them to the surface. Um, and you know, we were also talking about this when I got, I went to Avila, Spain to research this because she does a, a pilgrimage to Avila. And I went for the first time three weeks by myself. It was it was an incredibly powerful experience. But I came back and I had written the first draft. And my editor's like sends it back within three days or something and says, you know, this isn't cooked yet. <laughs> and I wasn't necessarily devastated because I knew it wasn't cooked, right? I mean, that's a first draft. But it was like, you know, her the interesting thing is I'm an incredibly emotional person, but they're always having to pull that out of me. I, I write the story and then I have to flesh it out, you know? So it's, it's in, the, in this process with your editor, at least for me, it's been this, it is magic. It's like taking what's already there and, and fleshing it out. Um, and I love it. I love that process. Yeah, it's a good editor is, um, is a beautiful thing. And um, I, I have a very unusual circumstance, which is that I've worked with the same editor for my entire career. So uh, I, the person I sold my very first book to in 2001 um, is the editor I delivered a book to on Monday <laughs> and I've been talking to all week. So, um, and that's very, very unusual in publishing. Um, there's a ton of turnover now and you know editors get promoted and they make lateral moves and they go out of the business completely, it seems like, a lot these days and mm -hmm. become agents, many of them. <laughs> um, and so I feel, I feel really grateful uh, for that, that relationship. And she, it's, it's, it's exactly what Anne said, that you want someone who kind of knows you well enough and knows your writing well enough to like see the bottom of the iceberg <laughs> and to help you kind of you know, polish the top of the iceberg, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, I, I also have an agent who's a re who's a, has a really good editorial eye. And um, you know, I I he I, I turned a book in a month and a half ago, and he got back to me and said, "I really like it, but the beginning is flat and the pacing is completely off in the sort of last third of the book." And I didn't even blink an eye. I just, I knew he was right. As soon as he said it, I, I knew he was right. And I knew it would take a lot of work to go in and, and restructure the ending, but I did it and, he, you know, it was the right thing to do. And I, yeah, I'm grateful for that trust. Um, That's wonderful that you've had the same editor. <laughs> I've, had, um, I've had five editors over five books, so yes, there's a lot of turnover and it's very jarring especially if an editor leaves, you know, mid book or before the book comes out. My second book was a kind of an editorial nightmare. It took three years and many from scratch drafts to give them what they wanted. And by the end of that, there was a new editor because the first editor no longer <coughs> wanted to deal with it. And then the publisher sold it to a new publisher. So all these things can happen. But I'm hoping not to repeat that with another book. Um, because it was it was quite a process, um, but but like Anne says, I think editors can do amazing things. It is kind of, kind of midwifery, and um, a lot of what they do with me too is sort of bringing out the emotions. Like you say that your character feels like she's not real. My main character has this issue where she kind of feels like she's not a real person. Like why would someone feel that way? 
And to me, it just seems so obvious because, you know, it's, it's a little bit autobiographical. So just realizing that you have to explain things. You have to get really basic and explain um, has been really helpful. So one reason it's nice to have your first editor stay is because it's their job to acquire your book in the first place. So your first editor will have read your book on submission and been like, oh my gosh, I love this book, and will have then fought with her publisher mm -hmm. to get you a contract to publish it. So your first editor is the most passionate one, right? Mm -hmm. And if you lose them, which can happen, um, oftentimes the second person is like, oh, this book that I didn't choose. Um, so obviously <laughs> a fear there is that you um, end up with somebody who doesn't love your book as much, because your editor is more like a project manager. They coordinate things like copy edits, layout, cover design, um, marketing, I mean, all these different pieces, they're kind of the, the central clearinghouse. So it's an important job, and one, and I think the reason they say editors don't edit much anymore is that there's so many other moving parts to that job mm -hmm. now, as far as, again, project managing, um, getting your book from Word document to object. Um, but, like, editors still do edit. They still do try to take books from, like, rough draft to strong, polished manuscript. Um, they send you what's called an edit letter, which is like a sadness sandwich. Because <laughs> the, the way they all do it is that you start with a compliment, like, dear dear Catherine, I loved your brilliant treatment of blah, blah, blah. And then they spend 20 pages tearing you down, breaking your heart, making you cry. And then right at the end, they're like, oh, but I super love the way you I ended it on this note of joy. Have a nice day. And like, my whole soul is broken now. <laughs> Um, right? Y'all get this yeah. too, right? Every yeah. time. Every time. Yeah. 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 Phrases, I struggled with. I yeah, struggled, I struggled with. with. I struggled yeah. with. Yeah. I don't quite understand. Oh, I didn't understand yeah. this. Yeah. That made no sense. Um. But you, you brought up the, the cover thing. I think people tend to, are very interested. They think we have much more control mm. than we actually do. Over, and I'm, over the cover. Over the cover. Yeah. I'm sort of curious. I mean, I, with this one, they hit it right out, I think. Um, the Can first, us, well, show us the book. Okay. <laughs> so I, you know, the one thing I said is the character wouldn't be wearing the dress and have the line. And they said, well, it's hard to show her levitating without the, and I was like, okay, fair, fair. And I really liked it. The, the first book with them, Storyteller's Death, um, is based in Puerto Rico, where my family is from, in Bayamon. It's landlocked. There is not a beach in the entire boat. And I said, look, I don't care what you do. Do not put a beach on there. And they tested a bunch of covers. And there was one with a, a particular fruit from the Caribbean that I love, guenepas. And, um, and it's very important to the story. I'm like, I like this one. And they're like, OK, well, we're going to test them. What did they come back with? <laughs> right? And I, so my friend Corey McCarthy, who's another Vermont writer, said, OK, look, this is what you're going to say. He's so smart about dealing with publishing say that they're exotifying the island. <laughs> Use that word. <laughs> and so I said, you know, I really, it's very nice, but you know, I really am concerned they're gonna think we're exotifying the island <laughs> within half an hour. <laughs> I had a different cover and they chose the one that I could. And, and every single time, Barnes and Noble, with my first two YA ones, Barnes and Noble, said, uh, we, we think this looks at, Barnes & Noble has, has had an incredible amount of power. They have so yeah, they much power. So numbers. much power. Yeah. And they're like, it doesn't, the, so with the Canepas, they said it doesn't look uh, magical. And so they added dark blue and some sparkles, and they were happy. And it's like, <laughs> so my first two ones, Barnes & Noble, like, they don't look like YA. Mm -hmm. Jumped, changed it. Yeah. It's sort of interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's something that a lot of people don't know, is that that, that happens all the time, where they'll, they'll test it. Um, Did you have any say? And I, yeah, I mean, I always feel like they show me three, two or three versions, and you know, they're sort of like, okay, do you, you know, what do you think? And or very early on, my agent said to me, "You get one tantrum, like you only <laughs> get one." <laughs> And so be very judicious about how you use your tantrum. And that turns out to be very good advice because it's like if you hate the cover, if you really, really hate it, then that is a moment to have a tantrum and something may be changed. But if you, if it's okay, like that's probably a moment to 
go with it and bank some goodwill with the art director <laughs> and you know um, and so I think you know I mean I've been pretty lucky with with my covers I feel like um, with the mountains wild which is the first of my Irish series the first version they showed me was was like a mountain but it was very clearly like the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> not Ireland at all, it was like nothing like Ireland. And so that was a moment where I kind of said, this here, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's important to me that, <laughs> you know, and, and they did, they changed it. Um, so, and I was, I have to say, I was very happy with this cover. Like, I really like this one right from the beginning. So that was good. I was able to be like, yes, thank you. I love it. So, <laughs> what about you, Margo? How did it go? Oh, I've always had, I've usually had some input on covers, like people, editors asking me about cover concepts, what are some icons or something that you think should be on the cover, and then showing me sketches. Um, this one kind of came out of nowhere, like they showed it to me and it was almost done except for the font on the title. And um, I kind of like, this is not, this is not really entirely my type of cover I, I admit like I'm, I'm really into the covers of my YA books three of which were done by the same amazing artist and they're just like so creepy so I, I kind of <laughs> like those um those illustrated covers but as soon as I showed this to people everybody liked it so I was like yeah this communicates the genre the type of book that it's supposed to be this is the right cover um so I never had a problem with it yeah, I feel like I've always had publishers who were like, what do you want in your cover? And they... Really? And nice. And they kind of like, kind of... And you give them your thoughts, right? Like, you your Pinterest or like your notions, and they come back with like, here's the artist, and you're like, okay, what are they... And what, see some sketches, and like, you kind of like work your way towards something. Uh, this book was hard to cover. We went through like 10 different concepts. Mm -hmm. Just concept, no, concept, no. Then things I like, they didn't like, and vice versa. Um, so it went through a lot of iterations before we got to this one quite late in the game. Um, so it's just like, it can be hard sometimes because like you want to please the marketing team, uh, you want to please yourself, uh, you want to please your editor, um, you just a lot of different people have ideas. Um, so. And most of all you want it to sell. Get people's yes, attention. Exactly. And I realize, like, I don't really know. I know what I like, but I don't really know what sells. And yeah. I've, that has been brought home to me that, you know, someone told me early on that green, books with green covers don't sell. Mm. And does anybody have a green cover? No. I don't want to, like, tear it. No. And um, I, have, well, I have a book that has a green cover, and it's, I think it's sold the least of all my books. So oh, maybe wow. it's true. You know? I'm looking over there and seeing a lot of blue, blue and red. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then they get the trend. Harper you know? King Summer's uh, Prodigal Summer that sold a lot of the heavy wing cover. Yeah, maybe if you're Barbara, Barbara King, King Solver. Solver. <laughs> you could have a blank cover with Barbara King Solver. Yeah. There was a kind of green book this year. What's it called? Come and get it. It was bright green. Yeah. Yeah. It's not blue. Yeah. Maybe it's changing. <laughs> well, it's always changing. It's like literally every minute. Yeah. 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 I think one thing now is that covers have to look decent in thumbnail. Yes. Yes. So very small. Yeah, that's a bad thing. So yeah. really intricate yeah. detail can be a challenge yeah. um, because people looking at the on their phones, like the little thumbnail of the book cover. Um, the other thing is like deckled edges are on the way out because people would report the book is damaged on Amazon. Wow. <laughs> the uneven edge uh, cut. And those reports will drop your book down on the algorithm. Wow. And so they're moving to like smooth cover everywhere. Um, I just because that like, some people sprayed edges. Sprayed edges. Sprayed yeah. edges not I right. love those. Yeah. I have to say. I so oh by the way, the beach cover, do you know why I realized they did it? Is that I held it next to when the cro where the crowd dads sing yeah. and it was almost identical. It's just that it was a different setting. And I was like, that's you know, so they try to jump on bandwagons and personally I feel like what are you are you either trying to deceive people or jump on a bandwagon and I'd like to differentiate. Um, and so it's hard. Yeah. Is it similar with your guys' the names of your books? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, titles are mm -hmm. tough. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So this, this was supposed to be the, the ecstasy of Tere Sanchez. Mm -hmm. And they tested. And this is actually a quote from St. Teresa of Avila mm -hmm. um, from one of her poems. And so I was OK with it. But um, my, my Miss Marple series is called Old Punks Never Died. She's not going to let me do that. <laughs> so you know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, 
Again, I don't know whether you guys have more control, but they, they test at source books. Yeah. This might be one of my only books where the title, like right from the beginning, this was the title of this book. Mm -hmm. Everyone liked the title. We kept it the whole way through, but that may be one of the only times that's happened. I've had a lot of title back and forth and title changing, and you have to make sure, you know, you have to search now and make sure there's no other right. book <laughs> with exactly the same title, and that happens all the time, and that can really... No really other book us. in the same genre. No other book in the same genre. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's because my book actually has the same name as a Christopher Pike book, and when my editor decided to retitle at this, because she was very definite, it was called Memories Can't Wait, which is a, the title of a Talking head song, mm -hmm. and... Um, she was like, it's going to be The Midnight Club. <laughs> and so I said, but that's a Christopher Pike book that they just made into a Netflix series. <laughs> she did not care. <laughs> it was not important. Um, but I was okay with it, because I actually, I like the Christopher Pike book. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's different. <laughs> yeah, I feel like author and publisher have to agree. Like, like I can veto their ideas, but they can veto mine too. Mm -hmm. So it's gotta be like some kind of like coming, meeting of the minds on the title. Um, which can definitely cause some arguing. Yeah. yeah. Some and the hills, choosing the hills to die on, which is what you brought up. Yes. Yeah. So important. You can't die on every single hill. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was talking to an author friend who is much better than I am at all of this sort of, you know, just like figuring out how to be strategic about all of this stuff. And she was talking about choosing keywords for the title that then are elevated in oh, algorithms, right? And, you know, that there's certain words that, for whatever reason, just, like, elevate you in the in the algorithms. So, I don't know. I, I don't think I could... You could do that in a minute, even. Quite. Have to do that. Agony's got to be pretty high. In the title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you a question? It's a process question. I'm wondering how you think about beta readers, kind of, when to bring them in, who you think, how many people you think about, do you put guardrails on the process? Like, how do you do it in a way that feels helpful and productive? What readers? The beta readers. What's a beta reader? A beta reader sort of, I think it happens a different part of the process for different people. Sometimes, like, you'll submit a draft to an agent and they'll say, here are my edits. I'd like you to bring in a few trusted readers before you bring it back to me because you can only read one book so many times before you kind of mm -hmm. can't see the individual. Drafts, um, but I think it might happen in slightly different parts it's, of the process. It's basically or, showing it to people, friends or fellow writers or you know people who, in some cases, who you hire to name beta. Yeah, yeah, okay. like beta testing. Right. Uh, no, I, was, so. I said it was a joke. Uh, <laughs> all your friends who are named I, beta. Oh yes. <laughs> it is. It's it's invaluable. I mean, I have. I have friends who I share certain, you know, and then you have ones who are specialists in young adult and special because I write, actually all of us have written children's books as well as adult. And so, you know, there's certain people I go to and trust the people who are going to give you the straight, who don't make you want to, you know, throw yourself off the yeah. top of the house. <laughs> um, but you have people who you get the feedback and I do it at every point. There's only so many times you can ask certain people and you have to reciprocate. So, you know, if you're not paying for it, you, you find a way to sort of, um, but it really is invaluable. For me anyway, it's absolutely invaluable. And early, every stage I do that. You have to be very careful though. Um, you have to be careful of, uh, of getting beta readers who don't actually like the kind of thing that you're writing. And that's, that's a mistake I've made. And I, I know a lot of people who have been really derailed by, by doing that. Um, you know, if I were to give my manuscripts to somebody who, like, hates crime fiction, <laughs> and they just keep saying, well, you know, why does someone have to die? I don't know. <laughs> so it's not at all helpful, and I think that, I think that happens, I think that happens a lot. Um, so you have to be really careful about that, and I also think you have to be, I, I find my best beta readers, interestingly, are passionate readers, not fellow writers. Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes fellow writers like bring a lot of baggage to the, <laughs> to the experience, you know? And there's, I, I mean, you like I have people who I really trust who are, who are writers, so I, I trust them to put the baggage aside. But like, I think you have to, you have to be very, you have to be very careful, I think. But it, it is invaluable and um, 
yeah, it's just, you know, you, you reach a point where you can't see your own work. Mm-hmm. And to just say to somebody, like, do you, does this even make sense? Do you understand this? It is amazing. I have a couple of trusted critique partners, just two, who are fellow writers. And um, when they get done reading something, it's, it's, their critique is usually so intense that it's like an edit letter. It's like I'm totally torn apart inside, you know? You, oh my god, you hate what I did, and so forth. Um, but in the end, it, 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 it almost always helps. I mean, you always have to sort of filter the critique that you're given and make sure that it actually works for you and that you're preserving what you want to write, write about. But, um, but since I started using them, I feel like things have gone a lot better. I mean, my first novel, I actually, or first published novel, I did without any critique partners because I had kind of despaired of finding people. So I think if you choose people really carefully, it can be invaluable. Um, so you have like the other perspective. I hate sharing so much, and I tend to delay it as long as possible. Um, and so when I'm ready to share, I give it to my editor, my agent, and my one friend on the same day. And that's my only like share moment. Oh, interesting. Um, and get their feedback and then do my edits from there. But um, I feel like I try to write without imagining anybody reading it because it makes me feel like I can just be creative and not think about the world. Um, so, and I find sharing stressful and it kind of pulls me out of like the internal kind of creativity and pushes me into this place of like, what do they think? Which I don't, I don't feel like is a healthy place for me personally as a writer, but I think everyone's so different, right? And everyone has different needs and it's cool seeing the different kinds of like approaches. So. And time is part of it too. I think like you have to know your timeline yeah. and know whether there's even time to, you know, and, um, I mean, I, for the last few years, I've been writing basically a book a year and I just don't, I don't have time for beta readers. Like I, I can just barely get it to my agent and editor when I need to, you know? Yeah. I had my psychoanalyst brother read this and it was really interesting because, you know, he kept saying, well, the, you know, the, the levitation is, is metaphorical. All right, George. <laughs> Whatever you think. And it was like, you know, we were just very different people, but it was also incredibly helpful because he's like, okay, well, we want to feel this in the body. He was really good. Initially, he was making fun of the levitating. He was like, oh, and you're an ovula. If you want to bring the groceries up the hill, you just levitate. I'm like, look, I'm so glad you find this entertaining. My life's work. <laughs> but, you know, and so he stopped, but it was like very interesting to have somebody who doesn't the magical realism is a symbol and and I know that there are layers and levels but for me it was like yeah I I don't disbelieve that the woman levitated so it was interesting how do you bring if you all have multiple books how do you bring different characters that are different and authentic that that readers really identify with how do you create someone from thin air in different books that people love or hate they don't come from thin air. They're they're product of their plots, right? And so, the character in the book is part of a network of like setting, time period, circumstances, history, story, and all these things combine to build a character, right? And so every character is different because every story is different. Um, you don't just sit in a, in, the, in a room and think like, ah, yes, a person. They they they, they grow over time as you work on them. Mm-hmm. And you know, I read an interesting article about the fact that we don't, we can't create people in our dreams. They are always completely amalgamations of several of different people in your life. And I think that's a really good way of describing, you know, in, in writing because they're, they're very much inspired by people in my life, you know, and you're careful not to, but sometimes like I find that my characters have similarities in personality and I have to work on my agent's really good at that she's like ah, this sounds just like your last and so you have to find a way give them a flaw give you know change it up so yeah I for me it's like a process of layering where in my first draft it'll be very sketchy it'll just be like Bob who you know is standing on this corner and I don't even know quite why he's there but I keep writing you know and then it's when I go back and I'm like, oh, Bob, like, how did he get here? What was he doing here? And um, I, when I teach writing, I do a, an exercise where I have students fill out um, essentially what are like therapy intake forms about 
characters. And um, I got one years ago from a friend who was a who was a therapist, and I've kind of altered it. And you know, and you just fill out these questions like, where were they born? What were you know? What were the economic situation? What was the economic situation in the house at the time they were born? What were their parents' histories? What were the, you know? And you just start answering those questions, and then things kind of come, you know. And you think, oh well, yeah, maybe this happened to him when he was young, and that, and it just sort of layers from there. I want that form. I, yeah, I can send it to you. I'll send it to you. It really depends with me. Some characters just pop into my head fully formed. Some characters might be inspired by somebody in my life, or even by an actor. I see in a movie, and um, just like visualizing that the character grows from there. Like this is a character that actor would play, and some characters are just really hard and have to be put together piece by piece. But I feel like I'm still struggling to write likable characters. I've gotten a lot of feedback about yeah. characters being weird or you know mousy or unlikable. I tend like the the main the main female character in this book is a childless cat lady. Which is really <laughs> yes, yes. yes. I mean, I think she's likable, but I know a lot of readers will not, so it's always kind of a struggle, but I think I, I've learned that to make characters likable, it helps to open them up and show mm -hmm. the reader their deepest fears and their deepest desires. Mm. Um, so, as writers obviously inspired by other writers, I would imagine, and I'm interested in what your inspiration was, and kind of a twofold a question, that's one, and then how do you go from being inspired by those individuals and not going into the realm of emulating them, but being creative instead? I mean, a lot of writers start in fan fiction, especially these days, <laughs> like many professionals who are published with their own original work began by writing fan fiction, just because it's easier, you can, you can appropriate somebody else's characters their plots, their voice, and practice. Um, it's like it's like training wheels. Um, and so a lot of writers do start by emulating. And I think the idea is you emulate until you find your own voice. But I think it's different again. I read so widely. I read like I, I read just voraciously. So I don't feel like I have been inspired in particular by like a particular author. For a particular book, but there are sort of different collections of inspirations that might feed into that book, and they might be in totally different genres depending on what type of a book it is. Um, and uh, I mean, but there were certain things, you know, like when I was writing this and trying to figure out how to make the first chapter work, I read a popular thriller called In My Dreams I Hold a Knife. Okay. And when I read the first chapter of that, I was like, oh, this is the element that I need right here. Like, this is how you connect readers with the character. So sometimes, you know, it can be a really focused thing that just helps you figure out how to solve the problem in the book. I, f I reread a lot, and I find that's a really helpful way to um, to sort of get inside, the especially for structure, like to get inside the structure of, of a narrative, and but without, because I know it so well, I'm not in danger of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of aping it, which I think it, which I think can be a danger, and I'm, I'm fairly careful about when I'm doing, when I'm rough drafting. I, I am not doing a lot of reading. It's kind of sad, but because I love to read, but I'm I really just like write that first draft like very feverishly and just quickly, and I'm not doing a lot of reading because I don't want other voices to creep in. But then when I'm revising, I'm going back to books I know have something that can help me, and I'm reading new stuff, and for whatever reason at that point it doesn't. I don't feel like I'm you know like I'm picking it up or whatever. I don't know. I, I don't think I, I've ever emulated, mainly because, I mean, you know, to say that I was inspired by Marquez, I can't, I'm certainly not going to put myself on the same level. Um, but, you know, I, I admire the, the, the language, the lush language and descriptions of setting and, and, and magical realism. And um, I read a lot, um, it very, like Margot, in very different genres. And, and it all inspires me. But I think with me, it... I come from a story, oral storytelling culture. My family told stories. Um, so I think I had a voice even before I started writing. I, I had sort of, that wasn't an issue. 
Um, and when I'm reading, I don't take it on necessarily. I do notice technique or things that I, I, I admire. Um, but I think I read so much that I, if I, I, I would be psychotic. I think if I, you know, it would be like too many voices, but I haven't had that. And I also started writing late. I was in my 40s when I started writing. Um, and I think when you're younger, you emulate more. And so I think I avoided that. No, that's very true. <laughs> um, Vermont, uh, you're being presented as Vermont writers. So what's different about being a Vermont writer as opposed to any other kind of writer? Or is it? I feel so attacked. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's a good question. I think it's a great I think it's a great place to be a writer. Um, I think we're, I I always feel like there's there's like space for creativity here. There's like room and space for creativity and there's a really supportive uh, writing community, mm -hmm. there's a really supportive bookstore community. Um, I, I think it's great. I, I don't know. Yeah. Vermont has like a surprising number of independent bookstores. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was at the New England Independent Bookstore Association conference last month, and um, there were so many people from Vermont bookstores that just like coming through, like like over and over. And the other states were like, how are there so many Indies in Vermont? It's like, it was small, right? And I was like, yes, but the Indies are amazing. So, um, and bookstores are so important for writers. You know, like, yeah. just having a bookseller recommend a book is so massive for, for every writer. So that's been huge, I think, having a community. Yeah, it is a great community. Yeah. I mean, if there's one thing that makes Vermont writers different from other writers, maybe that they know better than to portray Vermont as cute and quaint. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe we're a little yeah. bit more likely to know better, at least. <laughs> you definitely didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have a, a Break Up From Hell was my first book based in Vermont. And I opened a Hellmouth in downtown Stowe. And my husband was like, how is that different from foliage season? <laughs> um, but I, this, this starts with the UVM professor. I, I write it because I know it, and, um, but it, most of all my work initially is in Puerto Rico because that's where my you know, heart is. Um, but now it's sort of divided between the two places. And I, but to write here, you, you touched on this, there's space in life and in, in your day-to-day -day life to write. Um, in, I grew up in New York City. There's there's enough space, so I really like that. And also, Tom Green used to say you have to drive carefully at night in Montpelier because you might hit a novelist. <laughs> <laughs> so there's just a, the community is is so supportive there's of each so other. Many, there's so many. So writers, supportive. Like, mm -hmm. It's uh, they're always popping up everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Like that person lives in Vermont. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have one last question for you. What are you reading now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh God, what am I reading? Uh, What's on your night table? I just discovered Robin Hobbs fantasy novels, of which there are like, you know, more than 20 huge books. And somehow I never found out, I never knew about them before this, and I didn't even think that I liked epic fantasy as an adult, but they're so good. So I'm in the middle of the second trilogy right now, and, I, and I'm also reading Ninth House by Lee Bardugo, which is great. <laughs> I'm reading Nicked by M.T. Anderson, oh. um, which I read Elf, Dog, and Owlhead, which is a ch children's book by them, and I loved it, so I was like, oh, I'll try their new adult book. So that right now it's great. It's a joy. Yeah. I'm reading the new Attica Locke. I don't know if anyone has discovered Attica Locke yet, but she is a wonderful crime writer. Um, and the, her new one is the third in a trilogy uh, set in East Texas about a black Texas ranger, and it's so good. It's just, it's amazing. Highly recommend it. I just finished The Bright Sword um, by Love Grossman. It's this uh, King Arthur, like all the, the B characters of King Arthur. It's like mm. this very interesting, and I'm reading Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. Oh. I, I detested Eat, Pray, Love. Um, <laughs> I actually call this Eat, Pray, Evolve. <laughs> and, um, but I like her, and so it, it's interesting. She should never talk about MFAs, though. Um, I had real issues with that. But I like reading self-help, and I, since I work in the bookstore, I also try to read more 
popular stuff just so I have an understanding and can talk about it. Um, so I, I'm reading three things simultaneously. I have all these books and some of your back list of books available up here and I assume you guys are all willing to sign. Of course. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. I know, I don't have a pen. So. Would you guys have, Do you have some sharp pen? extra pen? Yeah. 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 I would love them too. Mine's in my bag. I have a special archival one that I've never had to do with. So. Hello. Hi. Hello.